Hello, my name is Daniele Sirusano, image engineer at Filmlight, and today I want to share some thoughts about additive mixture. Lately we see two types of discussions, which might lead our future practice of motion picture into the wrong direction. First, the misconception arises that camera input calibrations or IDTs that are built with, tr with a tree by tree matrix at the heart of the transform are inferior to more complex nonlinear color calibrations. Quite the opposite is true when considering additive mixtures. Secondly, the uncareful usage of the terminology subtractive in context of color models or saturation greatly confuses what is the underlying transport of today's digital pipelines, which is again additive mixture. So I thought I'd make a quick video about additive mixtures, especially in the context of scene referred image states. For context, we need to quickly establish how high-end features are made nowadays. This generalized workflow is used for almost all professionally made movies and TV shows for the last 15 years. Conceptually, some people argue that this workflow generalizes even to film-based workflows, which are around for more than 100 years. We start with scene-referred data, typically from high-end motion picture cameras. We take that data and apply transformations to them, so the data from different sources align better with each other. Intentionally, I try to not use the word color yet. After those info input transforms, we call that data still scene referred. That imposes quite some restrictions on the implementation of those transforms. We will come to this shortly. All the visual effects, color grading and finishing is applied in this state. Another transform we call display rendering transform is applied to this data to form image data, which is defined by display specifications and viewing conditions. There is not a single display rendering transform, but a family of transforms which have a common starting point, but end in different encodings for the different display specifications and viewing conditions. The resulting image data is called display referred image state. Before we jump deeper, let's first see if there is an existing de definition of scene referred and if so, if the motion picture industry lives by those definitions. The CIE has defined scene referred image state as follows. Image state associated with image data that represents estimates of the color space coordinates of the element of a scene. Note 2. Scene referred image data can be determined from raw digital still cameras image data before color rendering is performed. Generally, those digital still cameras do not write scene referred image data in image files, but some can do so in a special mode intended for this purpose. Typically, digital, uh, digital still cameras write standard output referred image data where color rendering has already been performed. Already here we can see a big discrepancy in the definition and its actual use in our field. It is not at all typical to work in color rendered output referred image state, at least not in the high end motion picture. And digital cinema cameras exclusively record or should record scene referred image data. Also the reference to a color space is given in the fundamental definition of scene referred. And a color space by the definition of the term color is linked to the human observer. We will come to that later in detail. If someone would ask me to define scene referred image state, I would write something like this. Scene referred data represents the recorded response of a non-human observer to the light radiating from a particular scene. Note 1. Besides fully reversible OETFs, the data usually is not modified in non-linear fashion. If the data is modified, it must be possible to fully restore the recorded response to light. Additive color mixture ratios in the scene must be maintained in the recorded response. In contrast to the CAE definition, I would explicitly state that we are expecting the encoding of a non-human observer, avoiding the word color at all. Not one clarifies that data which was altered for coding or workflow efficiency like camera log encodings are still seen referred data because we can calculate back to the response. Note 2 is a bit tricky to grasp without further explanation, so it's not yet a good definition. We will see exactly what that means in the following minutes. But a spoiler, this disqualifies chromogenic film or any other subtractive acquisition formats. So this slide is a bit of a joke, but at the same time also not. It raises an important point. Scene referred state can be sort of a superposition of actual image states. Of course, not in the quantum mechanical sense, but it shares some parallel, hence the analogy. We cannot visualize scene referred data directly. We need to develop it 
to a display referred image state in order to view it in a meaningful way. And that process of viewing adds some meaning to the scene referred data. So as soon as we judge or manipulate the scene referred data while looking at it with a viewing transform, the resulting judgment and or modification is indirectly tied to a certain viewing transform. Display volume and viewing condition. This means as soon as you modify scene referred data while looking at a display, that data becomes indirectly output referred. So there cannot be a graded scene referred image state. That has huge implications for archives and applied color science. So we are in a dilemma because color by its definition as a human sensation is intrinsically display referred. So can we apply color science to scene referred data? Or do we need to take great care if we apply color science models originally developed for display referred image data to scene referred image states? One could ask, why do we work in this ambiguous image state at all? The answer is simple. It's all about ratios. Here's the classical example of an exposure series. Same scene, but reduced camera exposure. I believe in this case by closing the aperture. We can easily correct exposure variations in scene referred image states. We add a base grade, we specify a reference object, maybe the gray chip below the yellow chip in a Macbeth chart. Now we identify the object in each frame and base grade will perform an exposure compensation. We see it is almost trivial to balance exposure in this pipeline. This is hugely important because small exposure variations will arise on shooting. So it's a basic but powerful concept. They are physically plausible edits. White balance in a digital camera also relies on exposure ratios. Similar to an exposure bracketing we shot here, a white balance bracketing. We kept the camera fixed at one white balance setting and changed the white balance of the light fixture from 2800 to 10,000 Kelvin. And if you take the camera and light fixture from the same manufacturer, it kind of all lines up nicely. The shot tracks along the spectral locus. Very nice. We can now do exactly the same as in the first example. We do not need a gray card, for example, I could balance one shot to my liking and then take the resulting skin tone as my new reference. Now in every other shot, I only need to pick the skin tone to let base grade calculate the needed exposure and white balance gains. Now if you examine the consistency of the shots, all of them look very similar. But we do not stop at exposure ratios because this is a, just a subset of the broader concept of additive mixtures. Additive mixtures of two lights will produce a light which lies on a straight line connecting the two lights in the observer trichromatic space. This is besides metamory the basis of trichromatic reproduction. But it plays a fundamental role in scene referred image state too. A mixture ratio of two lights with a 2 to 8 ratio will produce a light on the line connecting the two lights and the distance to the two lights is directly that reciprocal ratio. The resulting light will be 20% away from the light which contributed 80% and 80% away from the light which contributes 20%. Let's see this in motion. If I change the two lights, we will see that the mixture will always stay on a straight line in the observer space or a 2D projection of it. But what does additive mixture of two lights has to do with a scene? Well, for example, if you blur an image or have a blurred background, the blur is a spatial additive integration of neighboring lights. So the lights reflected by two objects will additively mix in the camera lens. If we look closer, the scene referred data of a blurred edge of two adjacent objects lies on a straight line between the coordinates of the two objects in the observer space. And our way of photography has lots of blurred image content. Let's look into the temporal domain. If we temporarily integrate moving objects, the resulting data is an additive mixture of the object coordinates of the two. If we temporarily integrate moving objects, the resulting data is an additive mixture of the two object coordinates. Trying hard here to avoid the word color. So motion blur will cause additive mixture. And the ratio of the motion blurred coordinates is exactly reciprocal to the opacity of the foreground object to the background object. So you might understand why a visual effects artist trying to pull a key does not want this ratio to be destroyed. The careful observer here might notice that the lines connecting the three clusters in this example are not perfectly straight. This is true, but the reason for this is a sloppy implementation of the camera characterization. 
Basically, the input device transform baked into the camera does not maintain exactly the scene ratios. Here's an example with a proper cinema camera and we can see that the motion blur areas are perfect straight lines between the background and the foreground coordinates. And here is a moving example of gravity creating motion and motion blur. And we see beautifully how this manifests into additive mixtures. We see that the, these different objects coordinates produce lines from their position to the background position. Again, our industry of motion picture has lots of motion and therefore motion blur created by additive mixture. We see similar behavior in gloss, where gloss manifests as an additive mixture of the object's diffuse reflecting light and the light source light. I'm not so firm in the saddle with quantum mechanics to explain to you ex the exact physical mechanism, but you can see what I mean. The list goes on. The last example I want to give here is spill light. We can see that we have a line connecting between the red appearing and green appearing object. Those lines are produced by small spill lights between the bricks. A bad example is the CG rendering kindly provided by Christophe Bernier. This is an artificial image, but we can already see how lines are formed on the chromaticity diagram. This is produced by spill and gloss. Let's stop down the CG rendering to better see the unaltered additive mixture. The sphere's object coordinates and the light source coordinates produce additive mixtures in the gloss of the object. Same is here in the orange object. But also the spill light from the blue sphere onto the orange sphere produces a straight line in the observer space. Once you see those lines, you cannot unsee them. So you can see that maintaining ratios is more fundamental as it seems at the beginning. So with all of this established, we can talk about how to manage different inputs like different cameras. Typically in our industry, we transform all the inputs to a common observer. It is though a misconception that this observer is always a human observer. Some color management workflows like ACES have specified a reference observer, which is basically the 1931 human observer or a tree by tree matrix away from it. But many other workflows, virtually all the others, use a camera or camera-like camera observer as the reference observer. I think it should be clear by now why we want to maintain scene ratios at this early stage in the pipeline. We need to preserve ratios and therefore gradients to do realistic modifications of the image. Some more examples. Some of you might be familiar with this image. We can see in the chromaticity diagram that a great portion of the image is being mapped outside the spectral locus. We know now that it is because we want to maintain additive mixture ratios in the input of our material. If we change the white balance in the camera SDK, this will move all the colors into the spectral locus while maintaining additive ratios. This is because the white balance here is using only gains in the camera's native RGB space. If we would try this with a classical color temperature grounded in the human observer, we still maintain additive mixtures, but we move colors out such as the spectral locus actually further away. Because multiplying a negative number with a positive number greater than one will produce a bigger negative number. This shows that applying color models derived from standard color science does not really generalize to scene referred data manipulations. You could say no, let's first compress the colors into the spectral locus using a nonlinear transformation, like a gamut compression algorithm. While this will meet the objective of removing negative values, this operation will destroy RGB ratios. Lines are not lines anymore. Now you can use the color temperature operation without increasing negative values, but however the resulting color perception of that red is completely wrong. We can see that the red hue is now different for different amounts of uh, purities. It gets a very strange look. We can fix the shot better if we use a simple matrix-based IDT and add custom gamut compression, which is designed specifically for this scene, locally maintaining RGB ratios. A custom designed compression will always be superior to a generic nonlinear compression. Most motion picture productions actually use the main production camera as the reference observer. The reason is that most motion picture cameras do not meet the loser Ives condition, so there is no exact transfer to the human observer. And if we maintain the gradients and ratios, we need to accept large errors in the conversion from the camera to the human observer. But every camera offers a bridge to the human observer, and often this bridge is used to convert um, other cameras to the main camera. The good thing is that 
all the cameras have similar errors in their transform to the human observer. So if we use the human observer bridge in and out, the errors cancel out to a great extent. But the net result regarding color science is that we do not have a colorimetric sensible data as our starting point. The human observer is not a first citizen in our pipeline at this early stage. If we put the preservation of gradients and ratios at the maximum of the requirements for transforming data into a common representation, then a tree linear transformation is the best option we have. The good old tree by tree matrix. They do not change ratios. Lines stay lines. Let's see some examples that should explain why more complex input transforms can lead to worse results down the line. This series of examples brings us back to the additive mixture. Here we see that both the spill light on the subject's cheek and the semi-transparent areas are spread along a line connecting the coordinates of the objects involved. If we violate this behavior by introducing a non-affine transformation, we can observe that the area in the motion blur looks wrong as does the spill light on the cheek of the subject. We can correct this example only if we straighten again the line between the object coordinates. We can conclude for matching inputs. The agreement with the human observer is a second order requirement. We want to get close but do not sacrifice gradients and ratios because the possible artifacts and limitations in image processing is a greater concern than color fidelity, especially because we cannot determine any display referred stimulus at this stage in the pipeline. It follows that the spectral locus defined against the human observer is not a hard edge, like in other color related disciplines, but a fuzzy area. In practice, the area around the spectral locus shows the incompatibility of different observers we need to deal with. We cannot, we cannot have both preserving ratios and agreement on the edge of the spectral locus. Any workflow which is based on human observer needs algorithms early in the pipeline that expects and deal with colorimetric unsensible data. I want to stress out that bending those straight lines produced by additive mixture is an integral part of the image formation process. But we want to start with straight lines and bend them carefully and gently to achieve the pictorial rendering we are after. It is easy to bend a line. It is much harder, if not even impossible, to straighten a dent in a line. Nowadays we have better tools to apply locally linear but globally nonlinear transformations easily, like X-grade and base light. Those algorithms can be used to construct custom compression transform or to greatly improve the match of different observers based on the actual photographed scene. However, we shall never add those nonlinear transformations into the input device transforms. We have other means like LMTs to define and communicate such color edits. So I hope that camera manufacturer will keep producing great cameras which maintain additive mixture. I also hope that skilled motion picture practitioners around the world will appreciate additive mixtures and see out of gamut colors in a positive light knowing that they can apply gamut mapping later in the image processing pipeline as part of the creative grade or display rendering. I hope this little excursion was informative and see you the next time.